supplemented by a different world reserve currency. I'm not sure what it will be. Um, it's possible it could be the, the Chinese yuan, or uh, it, it could be uh, the euro, could be any number of different currencies, or it could, could be a completely new currency. But the def definitely the handwriting is on the wall. And if you look at American foreign policy since the 1950s, a lot of it has re uh, revolved around the ready supply of cheap oil to keep the big machine moving. And if you look at our foreign policy in the Middle East for the last 20 years, you can see that uh, there's been a really strong emphasis on uh, propping up governments that are pro-Western and that want to trade in oil in U.S. dollars and demonizing any country that dares to start trading in oil with anything other than dollars. And that's one of the reasons that Iran has uh, really uh, been in disfavor with the United States. Uh, currently, uh, the, the situation in Syria is uh, very dire. There are so many different actors in play there that uh, it's a really a, uh, a, a gamble to see how it's all going to turn out. There are so many nation states and so many surrogate armies involved in Syria, it's really hard to keep track. You've got the Soviet, uh, the former Soviets, the Russians have, have come in um, with the goal of both supporting the um, Syrian government and with trying to suppress ISIS. But they've been expending just as much money, manpower, materiel, and effort and air hours uh, with air sorties going against um, Kurdish separatists as they have going against ISIS. So we run the risk uh, with the involvement of both Russian special forces, the Spetsnaz, and American special forces in country, and both Russian aircraft and American uh, fighter and bomber aircraft in country, we really run the risk of going, as Slim Pickens put it, toe-to-toe -to -toe in nuclear combat with the Ruskies. So uh, we, we're really at, at risk of a conflagration in Syria. It could very well go nuclear, and it could very well turn into World War III. We see this occurring right now. Now, let me just clarify something here. Russia and China, for that matter, they are not like Yemen, Iraq, where uh, the U.S. can go into those countries and pretty much overrun the government there and do whatever they need to do in, in those countries, replace the government, whatever they're doing. Russia and China, on the other hand, they're basically advanced actors. They have weapons equal to or greater than the United States. Right. And as we move forward here, before we even get to a nuclear war, how do you see this playing out with Russia and China, if both of them get involved in this? Do you see the United States having the upper hand, or do you see the United States not doing so well against these countries? Well, with Russia, uh, we have the disadvantage of having much longer chains of supply. Uh, the Russians have almost internal lines of supply uh, into that theater. So... Uh, they have that inherent advantage. They also seem to have much greater resolve than the U.S. government. Our current administration, or the Obama regime as I refer to it, uh, has no backbone whatsoever. If you look at the, the history of the Obama administration, time and time again, they have kowtowed to other governments. Uh, they have... Um, bowed literally to Islamic governments, and they just don't show any really strong resolve at all. If you look at the way all the negotiations went on with Iran for the, you know, the much-hyped uh, nuclear containment deal, 
we basically caved into the Iranians time and time again and gave them just the treaty that they wanted with no verification whatsoever and with no teeth in it whatsoever if they were to violate that treaty. So uh, I think that if anything, uh, the United States is at a disadvantage in Syria and throughout the whole Middle East, and throughout all of Southwest Asia, really. And uh, as time goes on, we will probably see uh, the United States either hand off its responsibilities to surrogates or suffer some really humiliating defeats simply because of manpower disparities. And, uh, you know, we may very well see American aviators paraded through the streets. And depending on who captures them, if they're captured by ISIS, we may see them decapitated. And if we see them captured by the um, Syrian government, we may see them put on show trials. And if we see them uh, captured by the Russians, uh, we may uh, see them handed back to the United States quite ignominiously. So essentially, it's a lose-lose situation in Syria. How is this war? I mean, everyone's talking about war. You see it you know, on uh, other alternative media, you see it in, even in the corporate media. Um, and, you know, people have been talking about World War III. But the question is, and I, I just want everyone to be clear and understand how this war is going to be completely different than World War I and World War II. I mean, those two wars, nothing really happened here in the United States. Right. We, we very well could see uh, terrorist attacks or uh, weapons of mass destruction of various sorts used right on American soil. And uh, unlike uh, World War II, which lasted, well, if you include the, the Spanish Civil War, which really was the precursor to World War II, which lasted over 10 years, uh, we could see World War III last less than uh, a year, maybe only eight or 10 months before it um, reached a, a con conclusion where the disparity of force became so obvious, where the amount of territory controlled uh, became so great, and where the attrition of American military aircraft was so, and was so great and the expenditure of cruise missiles was so great uh, that we would be forced to reach terms with the Russians within eight or 10 months. Do you think before that, before we're reaching terms, do you think we would see forces on U.S. soil from no. Russia or China? No, but I think we could very well see uh, weapons of mass destruction used mm -hmm. against the American citizenry. Uh, the United States is a particularly difficult landmass to invade, uh, partly because we have one of the most heavily armed citizenries on the planet. I think only Yemen has more firearms per capita than the United States, and even those guns aren't counted. So um, it would be a, a fool's errand to try to in physically invade the United States. But uh, as history, recent history has shown, it's very easy to terrorize the American people. And all it would take is one uh, biological weapon, one chemical weapon, uh, one even subcritical mass nuclear weapon, just a dirty bomb, to, to throw America into an absolute panic. Do you think during this course, as it plays out, Russia would fire one of its ballistic missiles just to show that they can reach the United States and get through you know, the missile shield and hit a target here in the United States to send that, a message that you know we can do this? That's actually problematic because... Our missile defense system really does, does, cannot distinguish between a intercontinental ballistic missile that's carrying a nuclear warhead versus one that's carrying a conventional warhead. And the response that we've um, planned for and trained with so diligently has been always been a nuclear response. In fact, uh, back, uh, I guess, eight or ten years ago now, there was considerable talk of 
turning some Trident nuclear missiles into conventional warhead missiles. But that idea was scrapped because uh, the military planners realized that if those were used against any nuclear power, they might uh, misinterpret a launch of, of one of those missiles from a submarine as a nuclear launch and then uh, go ahead and initiate a, uh, a nuclear response. So I think that uh, the Russians are basically in the same situation. They wouldn't use an intercontinental missile against the United States. And in fact, I think that in, if the, in the war in Syria, their basic game plan is to use as much firepower as they can politically uh, get away with, which means everything short of nuclear weapons mm -hmm. in theater. And then they would use surrogates for the sake of deniability for actual tax, attacks on the United States. They would either equip terrorist groups or attribute their use of weapons to the use by terrorist groups uh, if they were going to have any physical attacks on the United States or U.S. infrastructure. From your statement from the beginning when we started here, all of this is happening because basically the dollar is dying. We're heading towards a collapse of the private Western Central Bank system. Correct. And here in the United States, we see our government doing many different things like spying on the American people, creating laws that kind of violates our rights. And it seems at this point that they're continually doing this. I mean, DHS, you know, they're looking at basically setting up a color-coded domestic alert system for domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what is the purpose of all of this? I mean, why are they spying on American people? Why are they so concerned about the domestic population? I mean, we see increased security at government buildings. I mean, the White House has new spikes on the, on the fence. Why are they so worried about the American people? Well, I think what it comes right down to is that the power elite wants to remain in power. They can't afford to have any sort of domestic uprising that would compromise their position. Because when you come right down to it, it's a very few people that are controlling a very big government. But that very big government is still, in total terms, uh, a, a number of government uh, employees, or at least pistol packing employees, that's uh, just a a tiny number compared to the number of armed citizens in this country. So they're attempting to bo both simultaneously monitor and buffalo the American people. They want to have a, a basically a total information awareness state where they can monitor anyone that they consider a malcontent and be ready to pounce on them. And they want to intimidate the American people and make them think that they are impotent in terms of having any sort of uprising against the U.S. government. We see the government continually pushing uh, gun legislation. And John Kerry signed the U.N. Arms Treaty. Of course, the Senate has not passed it. But is this part of it where they would like to remove the weapons from the people? I'm sure that they would, that's probably their fondest dream, but it's also uh, absolutely impossible for them to, to accomplish within the scale of the next five or even 10 generations. The reason being is that there there's literally a firearm out there for every man, woman, and child in the country. And Somewhere of upwards of 90% of those have no paper trail whatsoever because they've been passed on multi-generationally. Without any positive paper trail, uh, that they don't have a prayer of being able to round up those guns. And if you look at the gun registration programs that have been attempted in places like California and more recently in New York State, the level of noncompliance for registration is somewhere on the order of 80%. And these are American citizens who are facing felony pr prosecution 
for failure to register their so-called assault weapons, 80% of them are not complying. So that tells me that it's just absolutely impossible to try to disarm the American people. And uh, at, for purposes of illustration, I, I always like to bring up the example of the troubles in Northern Ireland. The uh, low-level guerrilla war that um, took place in Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, for more than 40 years was carried out with less than 200 military firearms. 200 guns were what was what was keeping the British bogged down in Northern Ireland to the tune of about a quarter of their military force for decades simply because they couldn't round up 200 guns. America is a nation of 300 million guns, and even if only 2 or 3% of the American citizenry uh, developed a backbone and decided to take up arms against the U.S. government, the pool of available weapons is so large that it would be absolutely impossible to disarm the American people. Not to mention uh, that uh, 3D printer technology is coming along to the point where basically anyone can create a, a gun, at, an untraceable gun at home, you know, albeit, yeah, it's probably going to be a single shot weapon most likely, but um, in the right hands, a single shot weapon works just fine. But they're continually trying. I mean, they continually... Oh, yeah, they, they want it to happen. Yeah. Like I say, it's their fondest dream. But I, it's just not realistic to think that they're going to make it happen. In the short term, they could um, pass legislation making it illegal to own a magazine-fed or detachable magazine semi-automatic firearm, and they could put a very stiff penalty on it. And But what they'll end up doing is turning more than half of the American citizenry into felons, uh, just waiting to be prosecuted. You, you can't lock up half the population. It's just not going to happen. We understand that this dollar system um, and everything that we've been looking at with the economy, we see that the economy, even though the government continually tells us that everything is fine, it's recovering, unemployment is very, very low, the Fed comes out and tells us that you know <laughs> everything that they're looking at is fine, when you really look at the real data and information and you see that retail is contracting housing is starting to kind of fall apart um, we heard of uh, Freddie and Fanny yesterday might need an injection of about 400 million dollars <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. yeah and you're starting to see all this and you're you're starting to realize that this economy is not doing as well as they're saying and yeah. we did have that scare in August September of the stock market but it looks like they've been pumping it up and trying to, it seems like that's the only thing they have to hold on to is the stock market. Yes, um, but essentially, uh, if you look at, um, you, if you want to look at the real economy, look at, at the genuine unemployment figures and look at the, at the corporate layoffs, look at transnational shipping, uh, like the Baltic Dry Index, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, look at all the, uh, the shippers uh, reducing their sailing schedules, for example. Uh, look at layoffs by companies like Cat Caterpillar Tractor in Peoria, Illinois. Cat Tractor is, n is a multinational corporation. It's not just an American corporation. And they sell over 200 types of heavy equipment. If they can't make a profit and keep their employees working, selling into a global market, then that tells you that we're in a global depression. And frankly, I think we've been in a depression. We've just been in the opening stages of it ever since about 2001. In the long term, uh, our economy is pretty well doomed because it's tied to a fractional reserve banking system and a system, a system of very heavy taxation and a uh, inherently weak economy that's being only propped up by artificially low interest rates. If it weren't for um, ZERP, or what's soon to become NERP, negative interest rate policy, 
we wouldn't have a functioning economy right now. We would be in the depths of a depression greater than the depression of the 1930s. So while Obama has been in office, he's nearly doubled the national debt. And all of that money that's being pumped into the system artificially is essentially just keeping this dying horse from collapsing. So how bad do you think this is going to get? I mean, are we looking at a 2008 type of crisis or no. is this going to be a lot worse? I think it's going to be a lot worse. I think it could very well be like the scenario I laid out in my first novel series, the Patriot series, where you see a economic collapse that goes hyperinflationary. Because at this point, the government has backed itself into a corner. They cannot lower interest rates anymore. And at this point, once their foreign creditors refuse to turn over American Treasury paper, keep renewing it, uh, then their only solution will be to inflate their way out of the problem. Inflation, of course, is a hidden form of taxation. So essentially what they're going to be doing by inflating the currency by uh, 50 percent per year, say, and then more, is they're effectively going to be placing a 50 percent tax on the American people on their after income savings. You know, the, one of the great things about America is that even though we've had fairly high taxation, they've only taxed us once. You get taxed once on your income and then that's it. You can you can keep it and uh, it's yours to keep. But through inflation, if they institute a uh, uh, high inflation through massive over, overspending, then effectively you're getting taxed twice. You're getting taxed a second time in the form of a hidden tax, which is the inflation of the currency, which means the, the, the buying power of your currency will be cut by half and then by half again and then by half again. And the beneficiary will be the government. It'll essentially be like what happened in uh, Mugabe's Zimbabwe, where hyperinflation taxed away the net value of everyone's savings, uh, both what they had in the banks and their mattress money. It was essentially taxed away to zero. Uh, by, by the time all was said and done, they, uh, their, the largest bill they printed was a $100 trillion bill. And those were only in circulation for a couple of months before even they became worthless. So uh, we could very well see a comparable situation in the United States where the government attempts to tax its uh, or tax its way out of the problem through a hidden form of taxation, hyperinflation. Overstock chairman uh, Jonathan Johnson, he came out and he says that his company is preparing. I mean, they have something like $10 million worth of gold coins. They're putting away food and supplies. Right. Um, and this is huge because this is telling the world right now, especially everyone in this country, that something is wrong here. And he's telling, and from this message, we're hearing that you should prepare. I mean, why should people prepare right now for what is coming? And we understand that there's a collapse looming right on the horizon, but why is it so important to prepare? Well, you really can't count on the government to bail you out uh, in any sort of disaster. And in the event of an economic collapse, the only beneficiary will be the government itself. They are going to do everything they can to perpetuate their own system as long as they can on the backs of the American people. So it stands to reason that we need to insulate ourselves from the effects of inflation. That means getting out of dollar den dollars themselves and any dollar denominated assets and shifting a good portion of our net worth into, ta into tangibles. And by that, I mean productive farmland, firearms, common caliber ammunition, precious metals, perhaps a few colored gemstones. But get your money out of dollars and into tangibles because anything that's in dollars is either going to be taxed away or inflated away to the point where there's nothing left. You need to prepare and you need to physically stock up on storage food because we very well might see a depression that could last 
a full scale depression. We, like I say, we've been in the opening stages of it for 15 years, but now we're going to see the real depth of it. The real depth of it could last another 15 years. So that means extensive food storage and developing the, the capability to be self-sufficient as much as possible through large scale gardening and through the production of, of livestock on your own property. That's where real survival comes in. And you really need to be prepared to do that because if the economy totally falls apart, there will be no source of resupply and the the starvation rate will exceed that of the Great Depression. So if I'm a person living in a city, um, maybe not New York, but a, a small city, and I'm living in an apartment, I mean, what are my chances surviving in the city, in the apartment? How do I, can, will I be able to go to the food store and get food and supplies? Probably not. Yeah, if things get really bad, um, we'll probably see a, an economic crisis that causes a run on, on ATMs, followed by a run on grocery stores, and then basically any other decent tangible that's on the shelf, people will, will clean out. All the hardware stores will get cleaned out, for example. Um, for your average apartment dweller, there's not a lot you can do except pray hard and stock up to the extent that you can fit in your apartment uh, in your, uh, storage food. And hopefully you're in an area where you have a open source of water that you can transport easily. Uh, because if there's a full scale collapse, we really could see a power grid collapse. And with that, all of the civic water supplies would fail as well. So uh, in a worst case scenario, an apartment dweller probably isn't going to make it. Statistically, your chances of survival will probably be less than 5%. And your only real hope would be if you had country cousins and you can bug out of the big city as quickly as possible to a well-prepared rural retreat that's already stocked because you may only have one trip out of Dodge. You may just have one trip. You won't have a chance to go back and get anything else. So the vast majority of your food storage, your gardening tools, your gardening seed, uh, weapons, ammunition, communications equipment, all that needs to be pre-positioned at that rural retreat. When we hear about the collapse, and, and you, we just mentioned the city, there's going to be you know no resupplies of the food inside the city. And a lot of people talk about you know people rioting, people getting, of course, very upset that there's no food. Do you see a mass migration at that point of people trying to leave the cities? I mean, there's yes. thousands upon thousands of people. And of course, the East Coast, the West Coast. I mean, there, there's a lot of people. Right. Do you well, see I think what we're seeing right now in in Eastern Europe with the flow of Islamic so-called refugees is actually an invasion of Western Europe. is just kind of a foretaste of what we would see in the event of an economic collapse in this country. We'll see a huge number of people who are forced out of the big cities and who are going to disperse themselves into the suburbs and eventually into the countryside. And in fact, eventually all the way to wilderness areas, some of them will get that far. But um, it is very likely that what we'll see is what I refer to as the golden horde, which is going to be a mixed group of both refugees, leg legitimate refugees and looters pouring out of the big city. The problem will be uh, most of them will be armed, and it will be very hard to distinguish between those people who are legitimate refugees and those who have actually just come out of the big cities to go looting. They'll be like Vikings. They'll, they'll be on a Viking mission. So where will the government be at this point when all this is going down? <laughs> I think that the government will be in hiding, quaking in their boots, hoping that they don't get uh, hung from the nearest lamppost. Uh, so, really, the government, at that point, the government won't be able to respond. The um, organizations like FEMA really are, are, are not prepared to cope with a disaster of that scale. Once the this, this system starts to break down, even any attempt of the government to respond will be like spitting in the wind. It, it's just not, not going to have any real effect. Even if the government wanted to declare martial law, for example, there aren't enough federal, if you take all federal troops and all of federal law enforcement together, 
they would only be able to, to institute martial law in two or three major cities. So who, who's going to institute martial law in the rest of the cities? It's, it's just not going to happen. The, the, the numbers just don't add up. And I think that's one reason why you see the real mission of organizations like FEMA, uh, it, its underlying mission that's not very well publicized is actually continuity of government. Their real mission is to try to preserve government functions in the midst of a massive collapse. And that's why the government has invested millions upon millions of dollars into uh, deep underground shelters and communications infrastructure to go with it. Before this actually occurs where everything starts breaking down, at the beginning stages where things start to break down, what do you think the government's response will be? Let's say the market, you know, like we saw back in 2000. Yeah, I think the, the, the um, well, there's already circuit breaker procedures in effect for the stock market, but the, uh, the government itself could institute a uh, cessation of trading on the stock market and on all the commodities markets. The government would probably declare a banking emergency where all the ATMs would be shut down and all the doors of all banks would be closed. And it would be a matter of weeks or even months before people might be able to get back into their banks and uh, be able to get to their safe deposit boxes. So let that be a reminder to your listeners, do not store your precious metals in your safe deposit box. Do not. You need to keep them well hidden at home because your access to those precious metals will probably be curtailed by a banking holiday. So when, I mean, a lot of people thought that, you know, the economy uh, was not going to make it through this fall. I mean, we saw what happened in August with the stock market, September, and a lot of people were saying, oh, most likely in October, maybe November. Um, what is your time frame when you think things really are going to start fall, falling apart? It's, it's really difficult to predict, and I, I never underestimate the ability of the U.S. government, which is essentially a banker's government, to kick the can down the road just a mile or two further. <laughs> they, they, may want, they may try to keep propping up the economy through uh, ZERP and NERP uh, it, beyond the next presidential election, November of 2016. Uh, because they may want to see um, a, God forbid, a Hitler administration. They may want to see that uh, be, get beyond that election cycle before they allow things to fall apart. And there are a lot of secret transnational agreements between nation states and between bankers. Uh, when they announced that... that um, quantitative easing was ending in the United States, I, I just laughed. Uh, there's no way they could stop quantitative easing. What they've done is they've replaced it with a hidden form of quantitative easing uh, by means of international transfers of credit swaps, for example, and um, some really large uh, derivatives manipulations they still have just as much quantitative easing going on right now, even though officially uh, QE2 has ended. Uh, there is no way that they can keep the economy rolling along without the creation of massive quantities of make-believe dollars. And I think they will continue to do that as long as possible because let's face it, the politicians that we have in office are not statesmen who are look, thinking about the next generation. Mm. They are truly politicians who are only concerned with the next election. For my last question, I wanted to ask you this. I mean, Obama is continually out there and he's giving speeches. And he mentioned this many, many times where um, people were asking him about a third term. <laughs> we, hear, we hear a lot about that. And he says it's completely unconstitutional. But yes, it's very odd to me that they keep bringing that up. I mean, we know that he can't run for a third term, but is there a way for him to stay as president? Well, yeah, I guess he could stay as president to, uh, pro tempore or whatever if they have to suspend the election. Say, for example, they orchestrate a collapse before 
the November 2016 election. Uh, if there's an absolute economic collapse and they, uh, there's chaos in a lot of major American cities, they could suspend the election and keep the Obama regime in office for quite a long period of time. There's no precedent for that, but uh, no, and nor is there any constitutional procedure for that. But again, never underestimate the ability of the government to um, keep things moving along uh, to, in their best interest. I think we could see, indeed, not necessarily a, a, a third term of office for Obama because it's not constitutionally allowed. Mm -hmm. But under martial law, who's to say what could happen? True. James Wesley Rawls, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Thank you. Thank you. Machine moving. And if you look at our foreign policy in the Middle East for the last 20 years, you can see that uh, there's been a really strong emphasis on uh, propping up governments that are pro-Western and that want to trade in oil in U.S. dollars and demonizing any country that dares to start trading in oil with anything other than dollars. And that's one of the reasons that Iran has uh, really uh, been in disfavor with the United States. Uh, currently, uh, the the situation in Syria is uh, very dire. There are so many different actors in play there that uh, it's a really a, uh, a a gamble to see how it's all going to turn out. There are so many nation states and so many surrogate armies involved in Syria. It's really hard to keep track. You've got the Soviet, uh, the former Soviets, the Russians have, have come in um, with the goal of both supporting the um, Syrian government and with trying to suppress ISIS. But they've been expending just as much money, manpower, materiel, and effort and air hours uh, with air sorties going against um, Kurdish separatists as they have going against ISIS. So we run the risk uh, with the involvement of both Russian special forces, the Spetsnaz, and American special forces in country, and both Russian aircraft and American uh, fighter and bomber aircraft in country. We really run the risk of going as Slim Pickens put it, toe-to-toe -to -toe in nuclear combat with the Ruskies. So uh, we, we're really at, at risk of a conflagration in Syria. It could very well go nuclear, and it could very well turn into World War III. We see this occurring right now. Now, let me just clarify something here. Russia and China, for that matter, they are not like Yemen Iraq, where uh, the U.S. can go into those countries and pretty much overrun the government there and do whatever they need to do in, in those countries, replace the government, whatever they're doing. Russia and China, on the other hand, they're basically advanced actors. They have weapons equal to or greater than the United States. You know, on uh, other alternative media, you see it in, even in the corporate media, um, and, you know, people have been talking about World War III. But the question is, and I, and I just want everyone to be clear and understand how this war is going to be completely different than World War I and World War II. I mean, those two wars, nothing really happened here in the United States. Right. We, we very well could see uh, terrorist attacks or uh, weapons of mass destruction of various sorts used right on American soil. And uh, unlike uh, World War II, which lasted, well, if you include the, the Spanish Civil War, which really was the precursor to World War II, which lasted over 10 years, uh, we could see World War III 
last less than uh, a year, maybe only eight or ten months before it um, reached a, a con conclusion where the disparity of force became so obvious, where the amount of territory controlled uh, became so great, and where the attrition of American military aircraft was so and was so great and the expenditure of cruise missiles was so great uh, that we would be forced to reach terms with the Russians within eight or ten months. Do you think before that, before we're reaching terms, do you think we would see forces on U.S. soil from no. Russia or China? No, but I think we could very well see uh, weapons of mass destruction used mm -hmm. against the American citizenry. Uh, the United States is a particularly difficult landmass to invade, uh, partly because we have one of the most heavily armed citizenries on the planet. I think only Yemen has more firearms per capita than the United States, and even those guns aren't counted. So um, it would be a, a fool's errand to try to physically invade the United States. But uh, as history recent history has shown it's very easy to terrorize the american people and all it would take is one uh, biological weapon one chemical weapon uh one even subcritical mass nuclear weapon uh, just a dirty bomb to to throw america into an absolute panic do you think during this course as it plays out, Russia would fire one of its ballistic missiles just to show that they can reach the United States and get through, you know, the missile shield and hit a target here in the United States to send that, a message that, you know, we can do this. That's actually problematic because our missile defense system really does, does, cannot distinguish between a intercontinental ballistic missile. Hi, and welcome to the X-22 Report Spotlight. My name is Dave, and we have a returning guest, James Wesley Rawls. He is a survivalist author. He authored several best-selling nonfiction and fiction survivalist books. Some include Patriots, Surviving the Coming Collapse, Liberators, a novel of the coming global collapse, Tools for Survival, What You Need to Survive When You're on Your Own. And on December 1st, he has a new book coming out called Land of Promise. His expertise is primarily in retreat, security, food storage, firearms, communications, first aid, and off-grid power system. James is a former U.S. Army intelligence officer and is the owner and creator of survivalblog.com. James, welcome to the Spotlight. Thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks for coming back on with us. And I wanted to start out what has been happening across the ocean here in the Middle East and in China. Now, we see the United States, they just sailed their warships out in the Pacific around the Spratly Islands. And we see things are really heating up in the Middle East. And we see Russia now is in Syria fighting mm -hmm. the Islamic State. And I just wanted to kind of bring this together and try to understand what is happening at this point and why is all this happening right now? Well, I, I think the thing to keep in mind is that um, what's going on in, in East Asia and what's going on in Southwest Asia is really evidence of a titanic power struggle uh, that's going on. It's a struggle between nation states, it's, and it's a, st a struggle between currencies. We have a, uh, the, the U.S. dollar has been the world's reserve currency uh, since world, end of World War II, and uh, they desperately want to retain that status as the world's reserve currency. But we have a government that has a debt level uh, around 110% of GDP, and it's just a matter of time before the d U.S. dollar falls into disfavor and is supplanted by a different world reserve currency. I'm not sure what it will be. Um, it's possible it could be the, the Chinese yuan, or uh, it, it could be... Uh, the euro could be uh, any number of different currencies, or it could, could be a completely new currency. But the def definitely, the handwriting is on the wall. And if you look at American foreign policy 
since the 1950s, a lot of it has re uh, revolved around the ready supply of cheap oil to keep the big that's carrying a nuclear warhead versus one that's carrying a conventional warhead. And the response that we've um, planned for and trained with so diligently has been always been a nuclear response. In fact, uh, back, uh, I guess, eight or ten years ago now, there was considerable talk of turning some Trident nuclear missiles into conventional warhead missiles, but that idea was scrapped because uh, the military planners realized that if those were used against any nuclear power, they might uh, misinterpret a launch of, of one of those missiles from a submarine as a nuclear launch and then uh, go ahead and initiate a, uh, a nuclear response. So I think that uh, the Russians are basically in the same situation. They wouldn't use an intercontinental missile against the United States. And in fact, I think that in, if the, in the war in Syria, their basic game plan is to use as much firepower as they can politically uh, get away with, which means everything short of nuclear weapons mm -hmm. in theater. And then they would use surrogates for the sake of deniability for actual tax, attacks on the United States. They would either equip terrorist groups or attribute their use of weapons to the use by terrorist groups uh, if they were going to have any physical attacks on the United States or U.S. infrastructure. From your statement from the beginning when we started here, all of this is happening because basically the dollar is dying. We're heading towards a collapse of the private Western Central Bank system. Correct. And here in the United States, we see our government doing many different things, like spying on the American people, creating laws that kind of violates our rights. And it seems at this point that they're continually doing this. I mean, DHS, you know, they're looking at basically setting up a color-coded domestic alert system for domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what is the purpose of all of this? I mean, why are they spying on American people? Why are they so concerned about the domestic population? I mean, we see increased security at government buildings. I mean, the White House has new spikes on the, on the fence. Why are they so worried about the American people? Well, I think what it comes right down to is that the power elite wants to remain in power. They can't. It's, right? And as we move forward here, before we even get to a nuclear war, how do you see this playing out with Russia and China, if both of them get involved in this? Do you see the United States having the upper hand, or do you see the United States not doing so well against these countries? Well, with Russia, uh, we have the disadvantage of having much longer chains of supply. Uh, the Russians have almost internal lines of supply uh, into that theater. So uh, they have that inherent advantage. They also seem to have much greater resolve than the U.S. government. Our current administration, or the Obama regime as I refer to it, uh, has no backbone whatsoever. If you look at the, the history of the Obama administration, time and time again, they have kowtowed to other governments, um, they have uh, bowed literally to Islamic governments, and they just don't show any really strong resolve at all. If you look at the way all the negotiations went on with Iran for the you know the much hyped uh, nuclear containment deal, we basically caved into the Iranians time and time again and gave them just the treaty that they wanted with no verification whatsoever and with no teeth in it whatsoever if they were to violate that treaty. So 